All right, let me go by these. Mark already did that. When I was a child, so many years ago, is particularly when I was in elementary school, we did two things every day. We recited two things, and no, one of them was not the Pledge of Allegiance. I was in Canada, so we didn't pledge allegiance to the flag, but we did sing or say, God save the Queen. I can still give you all the words today. We grew up saying, God save the Queen. This was before Canada kind of got their independence from uh, Britain. The other one you're all familiar with was what? The Lord's Prayer. Everybody knew it. It was just something you did. And that was not unique to Canada. Obviously, that was a, a staple in Western culture. It was just simply what we did, right? And it's been that way in Western culture for about 2,000 years. Um, in the U.S., it was actually could be mandated in schools up until 1962. And it's still, even long after that, uh, was still part of what people did in their growing up years. As early as the first century after Jesus, the Lord's Prayer was used... Um, in the prayer life of the early church, uh, St. Augustine, three, 400 A.D., he taught about it. It's uh, all the different expressions of the church have used it in their services. It became part of liturgies. It became part of rituals. It became part of praying the rosary. If you grew up in the Catholic faith, it's been part of AA meetings for like 100 years. Uh, it was even used, and I didn't know this, but people used to use this to cook before we had clocks. They would time their recipes by saying, simmer the broth for three Lord's prayers, right? And they would, they would actually use it like that, okay? And many of you have used it for your kids' bedtimes or things like that. Well, I think I told this story at one of our leaders' meetings, but it was at a funeral some years ago. It was for a, a family that I didn't know. They weren't really a core part of our church, so I didn't really have any history with them. And they had no requests. A lot of funerals are very complicated, and they want to have this person share or this person share. Well, this family, it was really simple. They didn't have hardly anything they needed to do. The only thing they asked was that at the end, I lead everybody in the Lord's Prayer. I thought, no problem. I can do that. I didn't write it down. I didn't put it in my notes because I thought, I've said it like a thousand times in my life. No big deal. And so we're at the end of the funeral and it's very moving. And I said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And my mind went blank. I had no idea what to say next. Now, very embarrassing. Thankfully, people knew what to say next. So they kind of continued, but they didn't have me leading. So it kind of faltered a little bit. And I listened. And I found, Oh, yeah. And I kind of caught in at the end. And the funeral ended. I was mortified. And I thought people were going to criticize me. And this lady came up to me after. And she grabbed my hands and she said, it was so powerful that you were so choked up with emotion that you couldn't finish the prayer. <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to go with that. That sounds really good. I'll just leave it there. Well, we, we've been in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthews 5 through 7. That's what it's called. It's been referred to. And it's this whole idea of Jesus talking about life in the kingdom. And this main idea we've been running with for the entire thing is this. Jesus is laying out what life, is the, what life in God's kingdom looks like. And that really, if that's how we live, if we live according to the principles of the kingdom, that's life the way God designed it to be. And so what we found out was that our lives really then, if we're a follower of Jesus, our lives are to reflect the heart of God the Father. It's not so much about rules and regulations, but this, Jesus was trying to get them to understand this is what God wants. This is what he desires this is how you should live. And in chapter 5, it was all about our relationships with other people. If you remember, we looked at all those different things. And then in chapter 6, what we've been looking at is how we practice our righteousness, which is simply the way we follow Jesus. And in doing so, he's emphasized that motivation, why we do what we do, matters. In other words, we don't do these things of righteousness because we think it's going to cause other people to love us or because it's going to manipulate God or something like that. We came to this conclusion that it's simply that we are to live for an audience of one. In other words, we practice our righteousness because God is always there. And so last week we began by looking at how it looks at our prayer life. And that's going to frame out, if you haven't seen or heard last week's message, I would encourage you to do so because it frames out a lot of what we're going to talk about today. 
But if you're like most people, it's very easy for prayer to get mechanical. Everybody knows what that means, right? Where it just kind of becomes... Have you ever had one of those where you start praying and you're four sentences in and you realize, I have no idea what I'm saying because I'm actually still thinking about something that happened yesterday, but these are the same words I say all the time. It's just very easy for that to happen. And it can be imitated by people who are the really good prayers, right? The really eloquent ones. We looked at this last week. And if we're honest, even if we've been praying for years and years, we can wonder if it really makes a difference. Does it matter that we pray, honestly? And it can get very boring. But it doesn't have to be that way. So, Jesus last week talked about, and we're going to come back to it for in a second, about what sets up prayer. And then he goes on into telling us, well then, based on everything I just told you, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, then your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. By the way, this is found in two different places. Luke actually also has a version of this Lord's Prayer, but it's a little more abbreviated than the Matthew one, and it was actually in response to a whole different question that the disciples were giving. There have been more sermons, more studies, more books, more teachings about the Lord's Prayer than you can count. I mean, just go on Amazon and and type it in and see how many books or teachings come up on this. And what they typically do, and if you've been in church for any length of time, you've probably heard sermons on this, you've probably done studies on this. What it typically does is we look at the main elements of the prayer, each of the lines in the prayer, and how Jesus is modeling different aspects of what prayer life looked like. Anybody had that happen before, right? That's kind of how we've looked at this, right? So this is all good stuff, really good stuff. But I want to zero in this morning on one statement that starts this whole thing off. This then is how you should pray, our Father. Now, look what he says at the beginning. This then is how you should pray. That means what he's about to teach about prayer is connected to what he just said. This is why last week is so important. In other words, based on what I just told you about prayer, based on what I just taught you, I'm going to tell you how you should pray. So think about what we learned last week. I'll give you a little brief refresher if you weren't. He says, um, prayer isn't something you do to get attention. It's not something you're doing to get recognized. It's not to show how spiritual you are. And since that's what prayer isn't, in other words, you're not doing this because it's going to manipulate God. It's not because it shows how great you are, how spiritual you are. None of those things are true. In fact, it's not about your fancy words. It's not about your abilities to pray. If you remember from last week, we came to the conclusion it was simply this. Every follower of Jesus, what Jesus is saying is every follower of Jesus, everybody who follows me, should pray. It's part of their life. And the reason you pray is to grow in intimacy and communion with their Heavenly Father. That's why you're praying. It's not for all these reasons. It's not to try and convince God to do something. None of that's true. Remember, we looked at all this last week. So, and then, he, by the way, just in case you think that's reaching, it's not because the whole idea of starting this prayer with our Father, and you've heard this before, is revolutionary. The word he gave was a very intimate, daddy kind of term, which basically was stressing the intimacy and relationship that you had with God. In other words, the entire way to pray is about growing in intimacy and communion with God. So, if you put all that together, it's kind of like Jesus is saying this way. Hey guys, based on everything I just told you. I mean, since it's not about formulas, it's not about mantras, it's not about repetition or incantations. In fact, I just spoke against this. It's not, it's, what prayer is what you're supposed to do so that you can connect with God, that you can have this deep, intimate relationship with Him. That's what prayer is. So let me show you what that looks like. It kind of changes the approach. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at the Lord's Prayer through that lens. 
this whole idea of intimacy and communion, and how does the Lord's Prayer fit with all of that? And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at it, because Jesus basically gives these statements on what and how to pray. And these, this is the part you've heard before. There's like five separate statements in here. Some people break it down to seven, but there's five central phrases. And then we're going to look at what does that have to do with intimacy with God? I'm hopeful, because it did this for me, if you were to pray this way, it kind of shifts some things in your prayer life. So, let's take a look. Start from the first one. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The thing that Jesus is talking about here is worship. You've heard this before. When Jesus, uh, he begins with this whole idea of this phrase, in heaven, right? Our Father in heaven. Uh, And it's really there to signify God's transcendence, his power, the fact that he is holy, that he's the creator of all things. And so when we pray, he's saying you need to acknowledge there's a, there's a separateness here. There's a holiness here. There's an awesome nature of God that is so big. It's massive. But there's a second part because he doesn't just say our Father in heaven. He says, hallowed be your name, which is our desire to see God's holiness, which is the center of his character. It's who he is. Now, interesting, it's not that we're asking that God be holy, right? God already is holy. What he's saying is, I want you to pray that God's holiness be known or be shown to others. Basically, we're saying, look, God, I want you, your holiness, your amazing character to be shown in the world and that we will bring honor to you in everything we do. He basically has got Jesus saying, look, it's disingenuous for you to ask for God to be holy and then live an unholy life. Because they're connected. You can't just say, God, (laughs) I hope you're holy. I'm not going to have anything to do with it, right? I'm going to kind of do what I want to do, but I hope that everybody else sees your holiness. It doesn't work that way. He's like, when we, he's saying, no, I want you to worship God because in your worship, you're going on to to recognize. So so get what's going on here. He's saying, I want you to recognize this vast gulf between you and me, which intuitively would actually make intimacy and communion more difficult, would it not? Right? Because it's like, wow, God, you're so big and I'm so small. It seems like it would be counterintuitive that asking for that to happen and that his holiness and his otherworldliness would be reflected in us seems counterintuitive. But here's what it is. It's actually deepening your connection with God. Because what we're doing is we're saying, God, I want to really understand who you are and what you're like. I want, I want to understand your character. It is so big and it's so much more, but I want to get as much of this as I can. And the more I do this, the more I understand his motives, the more I'll get what he's like, what his character is like, and I'll appreciate the gap between him and me, but I will also appreciate the grace that bridges that gap. It's kind of like a marriage or a friendship, the more you know someone, the greater intimacy grows, right? You all know this. When you meet someone for the first time, you can kind of hit it off, but it's over time as you begin to see what makes them tick, what they care for, what their heart, you know, what, what they're passionate about, what their heart breaks for, what do they like to do, what are the things they dislike, what are the foods they like, the foods they don't like, what's their passion for justice or for moving and doing things or, The more we know that, the more intimate and tight we get with another person. This is the whole point of what God's saying. Look, he says, in your worship, what you're doing is you're unpacking, you're appreciating who God is in relation to yourself. And the more you do that, the deeper your connection goes. Isaiah saw God in the throne room, and it wrecked him because it was so glorious and so holy and so big, he fell on his face, but it led to an intimacy because then God said, who can I send? And he said, me, come on. Right? Worship should lead to greater connection and greater depth of relationship. Because the more I understand someone, the more I can emulate them. And remember, he said, we're supposed to honor God in our actions, so the more I understand who God's like, the more I'm likely to follow what he wants me to do. That's number one. Number two, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is simply saying, God, I'm going to let you send the agenda for my life. 
Whenever we hear discuss God's kingdom, and we see this all over in this prayer and in this, um, and in this entire uh, sermon, it's essentially just simply saying it's a reference to God's rule and his reign. It's saying, okay, there's a kingdom. You're the king, God, and you rule over this kingdom. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're seeking. And so what we're basically saying, asking God, is saying, if I want your will to be done, then I want your design for the world, the way you see the world, the way you rule the world, the way you see your subjects, that's what I want to see happen in the world. Your desire for justice, your desire for mercy, your desire for humility. God, that's what I want to see. And basically what we're saying is I want... The world around us, so when you look at your federal government, your state government, the schools, we're seeking God that his will, the way he would want the world to go, would happen. And most of you are like, yeah, that's what we need to pray. And then God says, yeah, but I also want that to be true of everything in your life too. Oh, okay. That means everything I do, everything that happens in the world and everything that happens in me is to conform. Well, how does that increase intimacy? Because it tunes us to him. Because if we're asking for God's will to be done on earth, it starts with me. I'm basically saying, all right, God, I want to know your way in the world. I want to see your way in the world happen. And that means I want to live your way in the world. I want to live the way you want me to live. I'm actually going to put your desires ahead of mine. I know what I want to do. I know the things I like to do. These are the things I would wish to do. These are the things I'm inclined to kind of behave, but you know what? God, your way comes first. I'm going to actually deny myself, and Scott Smith's going to preach a little more about that next week. I'm going to deny myself to follow you. And when we do this, you know what it causes us to do? We have to trust him. Because when you say, I'm going to live God's way, then God, you're asking me to do stuff that I don't want to do or that I'm not sure how that's going to work. I don't know how that's going to manage. You're saying be generous, but I need every penny I have to manage my house. I know you're saying to forgive, but I can't stand this person. I know you're asking me to do these things, but you know what? Your will be done. I will do it your way, and I'm going to trust that you're going to make this work out. Do you see how these kind of connect, by the way? When we worship him, we begin to know him well enough that we can trust him to say, your kingdom come. I can intellectually, give, let me give you an example why this is so big when it comes to intimacy. Um, I, I can intellectually, in my head, know that God will provide for all my needs. Right? I read it in the Bible, I see it in the Psalms, I hear preachers talk about it, okay, yeah, God's going to provide for my needs, I know that in my head, I've read it in my Bible. But then God says, I want you to give money that you had earmarked for the thing you wanted most to them. You don't get the thing you want. Because I'm asking you to give that up, to give it over here. And we're like, oh, I don't want to do that. But we listen, and we obey, and we trust. And then God provides, and amazing stuff happens. Just guess what just happened in your relationship. It got deeper and broader and bigger. When we pray for God's kingdom to come, we're saying, God, you get to set the agenda. Then he goes on, give us today our daily bread, which is basically telling God what you need. Seeking God for needs that are right in front of us. And when Jesus says, um, um, give us today our daily bread, it's really, he means, I'm relying on you for my needs today. And for that culture, this was a huge deal because unlike our cultures where we get paid you know, two weeks at a time, we have a salary and we have severance, we have all these things, their laborers got paid for what they did today. And if you got sick and didn't go to work tomorrow, you didn't get paid. And so there was this day by day by day way of living. And Jesus is saying, you need to ask God to trust him for all that stuff. Tell him what you need. Depend on him. And remember, he started this whole thing by saying, God knows what you need before you pray. So he already knows what you need. The reason you're asking is this. It helps with relational humility. When I bring my request to God, I'm admitting that I am needy and I can't do it all myself. I'm basically articulating to God, 
I have things that I want that I can't make happen. I can't do this. God, this is you. This is not me. And there is something humbling about saying to God, I can't fix it. I can't make it happen. Especially if you're a person who likes to be in control. And I know there's none of you here. But I can be that way. Think of it this way. It is really hard to have intimacy with someone who never needs help. You ever notice that? Have you ever been in a relationship with someone? They're always willing to help you, but they never ask for help. You know people like that. Some of you are people like that. And you're like, oh, I'm good, I'm good. I mean, I'll help you. I'll give you the shirt off my back. Do you need anything? No, I'm good. How can I pray for you? Yeah, I'm good. How, about, how, how can I pray for you? Do you know that you cannot have a deeply intimate relationship with someone who never allows people to help them? When we talk to God, God's like, look, this is part of our relational thing. You need to come to me and let me know that you can't do this on your own. I know people who will never pray for themselves, will only ever pray for others, and they think it's a mark of humility and honor. And in fact, God's saying, you're missing the point. You have to depend on me. I already know you need all these things. Talk to me about it. When we ask for our daily needs, we're not just admitting not only that we can't do it, but in fact, we don't even know if we're asking for the right things. Because we get up there and we're like, okay, God, <laughs> this is what I want. And God's like, yeah, you're not getting that. Okay? They just... And what we're, what we're really admitting when we say, give us today our daily bread, is not only are we saying, I depend on you, but God, I'm giving you the right to decide what I need. I used to hear uh, when I was growing up that if you prayed, God said, you remember this? Yes, no, or maybe, or wait. Right? Do you remember that? I, as I've gotten older, I've, I've come to the conclusion I, that maybe it's just the way I look at it. I don't like that because I think it, it presents it wrong. I believe when we bring our needs to God, he says, yes, or I've got something better for you. Because he's always got our best in mind. And we bring our needs, and God's like, okay, sure. But sometimes he's like, no, I'm not doing that because I got something better going on over here. And you don't even see it yet. But if you embrace it, this is what I really want for you. We just don't see it in the moment. Let's bring our needs. He goes on, number four. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. We are to seek reconciliation. See, when we live contrary to Jesus' instructions to love God or to love other people, we sin. It runs contrary to his heart, his holiness. And you all know this. This is the heart of the gospel is that the sin that it creates this debt. That's why he uses this word, right? This, it creates a debt that we can't pay. And so when we say to God, I want you to forgive my debts, we're saying... There is a debt that I owe you that I cannot fix. That's why Jesus came. It's why he lived. It's why he died. It's why he rose again. So we had this whole baptism service, beautiful thing on Wednesday. He took the penalty that we deserved and he made forgiveness available for us and all we have to do is ask. And this is huge because if you've been a follower of Jesus for so long, sometimes this gets to be routine, but he's saying no one has ever sinned too much. No one has ever done anything too wrong the fact that we sin the same way over and over and over again and we never seem to get over that hurdle does not mean that he's given up on you. Why does this matter? Especially when it comes to intimacy and communion. When I was, when I was a kid, again, I thought that I had to confess my sin and I would have the passing thought sometimes if I don't confess my sin and I die before that sin gets confessed, maybe I won't go to heaven because I've unconfessed sin. This whole idea of penalty. But here's the point. When we pray this way, it removes barriers. Reconciliation always, because unforgiveness, think of it this way, unforgiveness always puts barriers in a relationship. You can't have unforgiveness and have a good intimate relationship. And so this idea of genuine intimacy and communion with a person you haven't forgiven or when that person hasn't forgiven you is not possible. You all know that because you have people in your families, you have friends that have been like this. And you're like, we're estranged, we don't talk anymore. And even if you've forgiven, maybe they haven't forgiven you or vice versa. And remember, Jesus' two commands were to do two things, love God 
and love each other. Which means unforgiveness and a lack of confession actually wrecks both of them. It's why, interestingly enough, this is the only part of the prayer where he, um, he gives some more detail. Because right when he's done, he goes on to say, by the way, at the end of this prayer, he says, here's how you should pray. And then it's like he almost says, let me, let me fill in the blanks a little bit more. If you forgive other people when, you forgive, when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. If you don't forgive other people their sins, your Father will not forgive yours. It's a verse most of us get very, very uncomfortable with. And yet Jesus is making a direct connection He's saying, look, your experience of the forgiveness of God has to result in a heart change that's willing to forgive if you're going to be his. Intimacy and communion with God is connected to our ability to confess and forgive. See how these are connected? It's why Jesus is saying, you need to be praying this. You need to be doing this all the time. You need to be saying, God, I have sinned against you. Here's the patterns of my life. Here's what I'm breaking. I need to make that right. I need to turn. I need to repent from these things. But that's not enough. He says, you cannot have a deep, intimate communion with God if you are living in unforgiveness towards somebody else. Can't be done. By the way, I'm not talking about those forgivenesses that just take a long time. This is about a refusal to forgive. Some of us are in relationships, we've been hurt so deep that that forgiveness can take years. That relationship is so fractured and we work towards it. That's, that's fine. God doesn't, that, that's part of the plan. What he's talking about here is this refusal that says, I can't and I won't. Our experience of God's forgiveness has to result in a greater expression of love. And so you can see how this reconciles because he not only shows us the things that are getting between me and him, but then he shows us the things that are getting between us and others. And he says, you have to fix that too. And when you do, your intimacy with God changes. Number five. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is simply a request for protection and guidance. This is an interesting verse because it says, lead us not into temptation. It's not that God ever tempts you to do evil. The scripture is very clear that God doesn't do this. So this isn't so much asking God to do something that he's already said he won't do. Okay? He's already said he won't do. It's more of a... Um, we are asking God to keep us from succumbing to temptation, right? They're there. He wants to keep him to protect us. We're asking for strength, for deliverance from all those things. Well, how does that foster intimacy and communion? Because there's a greater awareness of his presence. What you're really asking for here is, God, I need your help. I need you with me. I need you walking with me in this. It's a very personal request. It's not saying, oh God, I wish that you would delete this thing from far off, and then let me fend for myself, right? Although some of us like to pray that way. That's not what this is. This is an invitation that says, God, you've got to walk with me. I need your presence. I need you to do this with me. I need you to give me the strength to do this. I need you to protect me. I need you to walk with me because I know how weak I am. I know what's going to happen. Or I'm going through a test, and I know that if I don't have you, I'm going to fail this. It's an invitation to greater awareness of his presence. A child who is scared of the dark does not need a lecture from their father that there's nothing under the bed. They need dad to get out of the bed, to walk back to the room, to tuck him in and tell him it's okay. And then they feel protected. This is what Jesus is inviting. He says, this is the kind of connection you need to have. And when you're asking for him to do this, You're saying, look, I can't defeat temptation on my own. I can't make it through the trials I'm in without him. I need my heavenly father to be with me. Do you see how these are all invitations to intimacy and communion? 